All right, so now let's roll into the uh, Wayback Machine. It is the throwback throwdown. I was going to say episode two, but then that kind of makes it confusing with the context of this being overall episode 17. So uh, we're just going to say it's another edition of the throwback throwdown. We're looking at the 2002-2003 Dallas Mavericks tonight. This is, to me, my opinion, of course. I, I think this is arguably the most fascinating what if in modern basketball uh this is a case where we we know the trajectory of this right they get to the western conference finals for the second time they go against in-state rival san antonio and they go down in six but it, it's one of those things that fortune just broke against their favor dirt goes down in game three with a sprained mcl and is not able to return in time for the series and there was actually a major rift that formed in the franchise from this between mark cuban and the coach at the time don nelson regarding whether or not to bring dirk back uh, for that game six specifically and that's something that it took a, another year or so to really play out i think nelson had another season and a half basically in dallas after this but this was kind of the point of no return because the further they fell away in that next year and a half, the more this kind of boiled over, it seems like, with, with Cuban's frustration especially because this Mavericks team was right there. This was the first Mavericks team to win 60 games in the regular season. They were the four seed despite winning 60 games because the Spurs <clears throat> had the exact same record, but they had the better head-to-head -head record. So they were the number one overall seed. And because they won the, the Midwest division is what it still was at the time, they were the one seed. Uh, and Dallas, despite having the same record as the best record in the West, was the four seed. So some interesting shakeout there. But the, the whole postseason run is fascinating, right? We had already seen like when Dallas takes down um, before the rebrand and everything, when you have the young Mavericks take down the Jazz in, the, in that first round series. They then went and played San Antonio after that. And I think they got one against the Spurs in the second round that year. But this is that kind of rematch there. And it's like, OK, let's see, like, is, is this young team actually ready now to take up? But even just to get there, they had to go through hell just to get there. Like in the first round, Dallas flirted with disaster, the likes of which we have still to this day not seen. Dallas playing against a very, very good Portland Trailblazer team took a 3-0 series lead. They then found a way to drop three straight, setting up a winner-take-all game seven. And uh, it's, it's fascinating how this team had to kind of find itself a little bit it reminds me actually a little bit of 2011 if you mm -hmm. remember in that first round same sort of thing not a 3-0 series lead but they were up 2-0 lost the next two including a, a massive choke job of a 23 point lead in the in the th fourth quarter um mm -hmm. to to lose to that blazers team and that team solidified itself as well and dirt kind of in this point does it as well dallas goes on and wins game seven but this is it's it's a resilient bunch. This is the full mad scientist Donnie Nelson crew. They opened the season with like 14 straight wins, which was at the time the second most consecutive wins to open a season in NBA history. The Rockets had 15 and went on to win the championship that year, which means the Mavericks uh, were the most wins to open a season and ultimately not result in a championship. But you know, obviously the the Warriors blew that away a few years ago in their 73 and nine season. They won the first 24 games of the year. Ironic that that streak ended up being snapped by Dallas, I guess, but it's a uh, full Don Nelson, Mad Hatter here. This is the, we're just going to go complete mismatch, complete versatile lineup. We're going to basically be super fast paced, super heavy on the offensive side and defense. Ah, it's there. We'll have some guys that can kind of do that in the offseason. They brought in Raja Bell. That was a very nice addition. Uh, Walt Williams, also a very nice player playing in the last year of his career. They had bits and pieces, but they didn't really have a, a defensive team. And that really panned out in, uh, in how you saw their stats stack up. They were a team that could kill you offensively, scored more points than anybody. 
but they were not super efficient on the defensive end. Ironically, even though they had the best free throw percentage, they were terrible at getting to the line. It's like the number one in percentage, but like 26th or something like that in uh, free throw attempts per game. So uh, a weird trend there. But this was a team basically fine-tuned for uh, you know trying to just overwhelm you. They were just going to throw everything at you. Obviously, you got Dirk coming into his own. He averaged 25 points, 9.9 boards that year. Steve Nash and Dirk both make the all-star team for the second straight year. Nash averaged, um, I want to say Nash had something like, uh, I don't have it in front of me, actually. Nash averaged what, something like nine? seven. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 17.7. <clears throat> 17, 17, 17, 17 and three. Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. And uh, then Michael Finley had 19 and almost six. You also have Nick Van Exel in the six-man role, averaging 12 and a half points. And uh, another interesting name here that gets forgotten easily in Dallas. You have Rafe LaFrance, nine boards, uh, sorry, nine points, 4.8 boards, and 1.3 blocks. So you have a very, very dynamic Mavericks team here, but you see not a lot of defense. <laughs> Dirk averaged, I think, actually like 1.4 steals a game, which is kind of crazy for him, but we all know he it, it's that rip move. It, it kind of counts as a block sometimes. Sometimes it counts as a steal where the guy's trying to bring it up and Dirk just slaps it down before he gets it up past his waist, basically, in that gather. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a team that was going to just try and overwhelm you, and they're going up against, in that first round, uh, the Rasheed Wallace, Scotty Pippen Trail Blazers. Very, very good Portland team. Yeah. And Dallas first three games kind of cakewalks 96, 86, 103, 99. That one's obviously close in game two, game three, 115, 103. But then things start to kind of get away from them a little bit. 98, 79, Portland, 103, 99, Portland. Then it looks really bad in game six, uh, 125, 103. So the wheels are off. You've now dropped three straight. You're staring down potentially losing in the first round first team ever to have a 3-0 series lead and then lose it that's what you're up against and they come out in game seven Dirk puts the team on his back and they pull out a 12 point win back in Dallas 107-95 that's that's a huge win for Dallas but it's also again you're a 60 win team you're record wise tied with the best record in the Western Conference so you have higher aspirations than just a first round win at this point the problem is they're then going to have to go through in the second round a freakishly good Sacramento Kings team, a Sacramento team that I would argue might be the best, certainly one of maybe the three best teams, I think, to never win a championship. I mean, they're loaded. Chris Webber, Mike Bibby, Peja Stojakovic, Vladi Divac, mm -hmm. like a loaded yep. Sacramento team. And, you know, that was that was that was, that was, a, that was a squad back then. Oh, yeah. I mean, and think about it, too. Like, if not for that game seven against the Lakers with all the controversy of that, the, the original kind of claims mm -hmm. of the NBA being rigged and everything, uh, if not for that, you probably do get a championship with that team. But that goes the way it does, mm -hmm. obviously. And here you have a situation where if favor frowned upon the Mavericks in the Western Conference Finals with Dirk, it at least smiled on them here because even though Dallas drops game one at home, uh, you do catch a, it's a break for you. An unfortunate development for Sacramento. Chris Webber injures his knee in game two. And pretty much from the moment he goes down, Nick Van Axel says, I got this shit. Van Axel goes off, drops right. 36 points uh, in, in, in that game to tie it up at one apiece. And then as the series heads back, to i think it was still arco arena at the time in sacramento van axel basically is like yeah that was cool what i did in game two i'm gonna up the ante he goes for a 40 piece and if you watched jalen brunson against the jazz this year and his game when i think it was game three that he just absolutely went off and we were talking about all these guys all these other mavericks he joined to, to score 40 plus in a playoff game van axel's on that list this was that game Van Axel drops 40 points as Dallas takes back home court advantage and grabs a 2-1 lead. Now, it's a brutal series. It goes seven. It goes the distance again, which, you know, Dallas, not not an ideal thing probably for this team to have to go through so many go-the-distance uh, broadways. But at the same time, it does kind of uh, 
fortify them a little bit. Dallas loses game four again, pretty handily 99, 83. Then they take back game five with about a 13 point win as well. Uh, lose in six or lose game six by six and then game seven back in dallas home court proves the difference there again 112 99 so this is a this is a really impressive series win but i'm not gonna lie the chris weber thing changed everything oh it changed everything yeah as good as this dallas team was and how i'm talking about this being like the greatest what if the Kings have their own argument potentially, but anytime you're talking about, Hey man, our guy got hurt in the second round, we could have won a title. I'm like, yeah, there's too much in the unknown. <laughs> like if, if it happened like in, like in Dallas's case here, you're talking about in the West finals, Dallas without Dirk still goes to six with San Antonio. And then San Antonio um, beats Jason Kidd's nets in the finals that year in six really should have been five kind of the, the same sort of vibe there. So this, sets up the Western Conference Finals matchup with Dallas and San Antonio. As I said earlier, San Antonio won the regular season series. That is huge because these teams are very comparable in terms of, you know, their their overall quality. Like they are stacked, but they are ideologically opposite in every sense of the word. This was the old school Spurs. This is not when Popovich kind of evolved and took on more dynamic offensive sets and everything. This is like, you got Tim Duncan, you got David Robinson, you're feeding the post and you're working that. Now you got some incredible guys off the bench. You have some young pups that would go on to be all time greats in their own right. You got, you know, Tony Parker and Mono Ginobili also on this Spurs team, but not really, they hadn't really found themselves yet. I think they had, pretty much come into the league like the year or two earlier um then off the bench you got steve kerr that name is going to haunt dallas later in the mm-hmm. series mm-hmm. but uh stacked stephen jackson another monster game for him in game six like this is a damn good spurs team and they they got the regular season series against dallas and it, it's huge we just talked about in the last round how having home court was mammoth for the mavericks against the kings well now it's the opposite now they're on the road they do in game one take it in san antonio 113 110 but the tide goes bad very fast dirk goes down in game three i think it is in game two san antonio comes back and takes a 13 point win 113 119 106 and then it's in game three dirk goes down with the sprained mcl uh will not return We'll we'll get into that and they fall out of all that later. But uh Van Exel still stellar, but he's having to carry a lot of the burden here. Dallas is missing its number one score, a guy who was an all-star, 25 points, 10 boards a game basically in the regular season. He stepped up his play in the postseason. But now he's gone. Finley is still serviceable, but dropping off a little bit. The problem in the Western Conference Finals is Steve Nash has gone MIA. Like his production is not there. Van Exel is still playing pretty well, having moments for sure, but Nash has kind of disappeared. He was still playing around his usual level earlier in the playoffs, but it's problematic here as he goes against San Antonio. And again, we're talking about a stout defensive team, a team that really wants to slow the pace and attack your weaknesses. That's that's just what they're doing here, and it, it's kind of taking Nash out of his rhythm and making him more of a non-factor than I think is, is usual, more than you would see from most any other game the rest of the way in his career. But San Antonio rattles off three straight wins. They're up 3-1. Dallas's back is absolutely against the wall. And game five, their season on the line, they actually do find a way in San Antonio to get another win. So they win uh, two games in the series, both ironically coming in san antonio and van exel again balls out in that game like he he has another very strong performance dallas is able to keep the season alive let me see what the score was in that game five 103 91 um huge huge but game six uh is a different story it's a closeout game the spurs end up beating dallas 90 to 78 the real story is they pull away late. Dallas is right there just fighting grit and everything. 
but they they're not scoring they're not able to put it together meanwhile the spurs are getting huge performances from steven jackson he has 24 points on five of seven shooting from three tim duncan actually relatively quiet in game six by his standards 18 and 11 in 45 minutes david robinson only chips in seven and five but he plays just 16 minutes young tony parker scoreless in the game 13 minutes but he goes 0 of 5 ginobili 11 and 2 off the bench malik rose uh, 12 and 11 and 32 minutes like it's it's a game that feels like it's there if not for steven jackson and steve kerr and kerr in like 13 minutes gives them 12 points he comes in and he's just three 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 like he's just suddenly dropping it on you and that's where i said it broke open it's just him knocking down this just burst of threes it seems like out of nowhere and dallas who had still been hanging on for dear life right there trying to stay in it trying to keep things going just kind of falls back and they're not able to pull back uh back in there so finley ends that game with 13 and 6. van axel goes for 19 but he's 8 of 19 from the field so anytime you're scoring as many attempts as you took not super efficient nash is abysmal in this game as far as scoring he did end with 11 assists but he's six points four boards on three of ten shooting that is very problematic for your you know he's, he's your other all-star he's supposed to be your second best player and even with dirk not on the floor he almost plays as like your third best player even without dirk in this game so that's very concerning walt with uh walt williams in his final nba game gives 17 points on 7 of 15 shooting and rafe gave you 12 and 12 on 6 of 13. so right there they're right there they go to six against the spurs despite not having dirk and it's it's a huge question of what if i said earlier there was a rift that formed with don nelson and mark cuban over this the Mavericks doctors basically were saying if Dirk, if he felt he could go, they thought he would be all right. It was mm -hmm. kind of like up in the air of like, mm, it's your call. And mm -hmm. Dirk, young, still, you know, I'm trying to think of exactly how old he would have been at that point. He was 24. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. 20, I was going to say 23, 24. Um, still, still a very young player there. Never been at that moment uh, and wanted to go for it but he also had some hesitation and don nelson takes that call out of his hands and says i don't care if the doctors are saying he can go you're not risking this guy this his potential is through the roof you don't risk an all-time great potential career even for a one-off championship here if the mm -hmm. and I, and i think it was said afterwards like maybe if this was like the finals and you're having this conversation you think twice about it but you could have right. had uh, I got Durant type situation. Now that's the Achilles, but Dirk's playing with a, you know, we, he would have been playing with a sprained MCL. And Dirk went on the day of game six, Dirk went through a light warm up workout in the morning and he felt okay. But as soon as he sat for a couple minutes and then tried to stand up, he was, he was hurting. And he said years later, Dirk did that Nelson made the right call, that he might not have had the perspective at the time to go with it. He might have tried to play because he wanted to and he knew his team needed him. But you never know. And if he had a major, we, we talked about his longevity, the 41, 21, 1, 21 years, never had a major, major injury, never had a torn ACL or MCL or Achilles or anything like that. He had like bone spurs in his ankles uh, towards the end. But like that would have drastically altered the the course of his career um if he had suffered a major injury early on trying to come back and trying to push and press for this title nelson basically had the big picture view of that and took the decision out of his hands as dallas fell away the next year they retool a lot of things happen you have you deal uh van exel to the warriors for anton jameson you deal um lafrens to boston for antoine jameson um so anton and antoine interesting acquisitions there uh like i said williams retires raja bell goes to utah and adrian griffin uh goes to houston so this is a very different looking mavericks team they're going to basically try to double down on this offensive uh thing oh by the way fun fact avery johnson was a member of the 0203 mavericks um and then yeah. a couple years later he's he like 37 to 38 yeah yep. 
Mm-hmm. And he won a title with the Spurs in 99. So he kind of had both sides of that. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so Dallas tries to double down on this offense first mindset. And I get what they're going for, but basically it's a situation where you have so many guys that need the ball in their hands to create and need to be able to to work, especially a guy like uh, Walker that was a volume scorer. Mm-hmm. It, it just, you don't have enough basketball to share. Even though you have Nash, who's a, a floor general and can spread the floor very well, find guys very well. It's, it's just, you don't have enough to balance it there. And so it, it bombs out bad the next year. They get, they get a first round matchup with the the kings and they get smoked in five and i mean it's bad (laughs) uh and then the following year they kind of limp along a little bit and then nelson ends up mid-season resigning and basically promoting avery johnson into the head coach position and then two years later they go to their first finals so things things happen quickly avery actually takes them on a kind of reworks mid-season the team's identity into a more defensive like harder playing defensive focused team and that's what takes them to the next level so it's it's interesting looking at this because you say like well don nelson until very recently like just the last year or two was the winningest coach in nba history but he never won a championship he never even went to that's crazy that's crazy ain't it yeah that's crazy and how would his legacy look different steve nash never went to the finals never won a championship now he got one as like a shooting coach with the warriors in recent years but like as a player never got it how different would his legacy look Dirk, a lot different yeah dirk had to suffer through a lot of adversity 06 obviously bombs in spectacular fashion and then he has to go on basically a five-year mission of redemption to finally break through and get to the top. We, we know what his legacy transformed into after just 2011 alone. Um, Finley, yeah, he goes a couple years later to the Spurs and as a role player gets a title, 07. But it, it's just a very different, uh, very different format and structure for this team. Like they underwent major transformation. First, they tried to double down. It didn't work. Then they tried, okay, well, now we're going to completely upend it and basically rebuild just around Dirk Nash leaves that brings in the money uh, brings in Eric Dampier yeah. <laughs> the only the right. nicest thing I can say about Dampier is he did bring it was something big. yeah he brought something they didn't have for many years which was like a true big man and everything now he had hands of stone but you can also say like all right well it's good that he came here because it was his um, his contract was what brought us Tyson. I think it was his expiring contract or something was what brought Tyson to us um, finally. But yeah, um, you think about this, like this era of Mavericks basketball, it wasn't very long. It was, we're talking 98 to 05. Um, So it sounds longer when you put it in those contexts, I guess. But basically filthy, dirty, nasty. That was, that was their nicknames. Filthy, Finley. Dirty Dirk. That's why Dirk's nickname to the end of his career was still Dirty um, mm-hmm. and Nasty Nash. So that era of Mavericks basketball, the basically screw you, we're going to drop 200 points on your head if we can. They were right there. And I feel like this is a team that even though it had major defensive deficiencies, it was ahead of its time enough and it had generational type talent deep enough that it could have overcome this. If, I, I think if Dirk plays, now I'm not saying if Dirk comes back game six and, and stays healthy, that this all goes well and they're holding the, uh, I almost said Lombardi, uh, ah. holding the, the finals trophy in the end. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is if not for Dirk's injury, I think it's six games and it goes down. That's a damn good chance. Yeah, I think Dallas even though the Spurs got them in the regular season, won the regular season matchup with them, I think Dallas had the firepower to do it. I mean, again, yeah, okay, they won only one game without Dirk, but they were right there a couple other games. It's not like they were just getting the the floor mopped with them. And I see this team, and I look at then, again, the Spurs beat Jason Kidd in the Nets in six games, and the finals really should have been five. They kind of played with their food a little at the end. I think Dirk and the Mavericks could have easily done the same thing. And then you're looking at this team very differently. Dirk's suddenly a two-time champion. 
uh nash doesn't go to phoenix if this happens because cuban you think cuban would have hell no to pay nash at that point hell reason, no yeah the reason he didn't pay nash before is because he was a 30 year old point guard with a bad back this was noted nash was already laying on the floor every time out and every time he was on the bench um who was coming off of back-to-back very underwhelming playoff runs and so cuban looked at that and was like phoenix is wanting to pay you how much four for 63 or whatever mm-hmm. yeah uh we weren't really wanting to go more than like 21 so that that was it nash didn't want to leave he but he knew he couldn't turn down that money and so you know he's gone and he goes to win back-to-back mvps immediately his his career you know takes off to a new stratosphere but he never gets the big one if if he stays in dallas if they win in 0203 i firmly believe he's a lifer of a mavic or at the very least several more years before you know maybe breaking down enough and dallas moving on but i think he's there through 06 and i i actually did a, a what if on this before specifically on what if steve nash never left and i i broke down through all of this going through like season by season the subsequent years i think dallas you know assuming they win 0203 i think they probably get a couple titles because avery johnson this is where it's like up in the air because it's like the rift with nelson only forms because he wouldn't play dirk so they didn't win the title because he wouldn't play dirk uh nelson's style of coaching worked better for nash than johnson's would have and the offense went more through Dirk at that point. But if you have Nash with Avery Johnson, you can take the best parts of the Mavericks kind of refocused identity and still get uh, aspects that work very well with Nash as far as the personnel they built around him. I think that you probably are looking at a team in 06. I don't know if they beat Miami in 06, but I think that they have a better chance of it. And I, I think the 06 team was capable of winning the finals that year. So I think it's probably a two-time championship core at that point and uh, a vastly different thing. Nash's legacy looks different. Dirk's legacy looks even better. And uh, Don Nelson, not considered just a regular season coach who never did anything in the postseason. I mean, pretty much. Um, and you know what's what's so crazy, what you mentioned about that is, though, is how he's an all-time winning this coach. Yep, second the history behind of the M- Popovich. Now second behind Popovich, but that's crazy. And never went to the finals. No. Never. No. Never and, sniffed it. And, and, I mean, to be clear, like, that was really stiff competition around the time of, like, this 0203 team. Like, the Lakers were finishing up their dynasty. Like, they had one more run in it. You know, they go out and get, like, Carl Malone and Gary Payton, and then they make their run in 04. Uh, and they end up losing to the Pistons in in five games, surprisingly, in 04. But the Pistons are around for two or three years then. The next year, the Spurs are back, and they they win in Game 7 of the finals over the Pistons. Uh, And then, so it's like, you have the Lakers hanging on in there, you have the Spurs still kind of riding in the middle of their sort of pseudo-dynasty where they're never winning back-to-back, but it seems like they're starting to win every other year. Like, there's intense competition, but... I still think Dallas in 06 breaks through. You have so you have the team that got through initially in we're gonna say in 2002, 2003. Then I think 2006's team still breaks through. Mm-hmm. I don't know where it goes from there, but I think you got at least two trips to the finals, and I'm gonna say they beat Net the Nets and Jason Kidd. So at least one ring, but two appearances uh, in those early years. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of what what it could have should have, and you heard that it it, <clears throat> it had to happen, especially with injuries. It's almost kind of like they skated across with getting past Sacramento with Chris Webber going down, and then Dirk goes down. It felt like it was not like karma, not no karma, mm-hmm. but it just felt like, oh, we escaped that one. But then, damn, how uh, how are we gonna go down with our guy after we we were like, you don't ever want to see it in play injury because I love some Chris Webber dog. I love that. But obviously, it changed the whole game. It changed the yeah. whole game when Weber went down. Just like to me, it changed when 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 Dirk went down. You had a double double guy. You had a guy who's a guy who's going hit the big shot. He's got the size. I would say seven foot can do multiple things. He was getting like twenty rebounds in a game, 15, 17 rebounds, thirty five points, seventeen rebounds. Dirk was doing that. 
You know what I mean? Um, so you, to lose those type of numbers and you're playing against the San Antonio Spurs where you're dealing with a young Timmy and he's just going crazy. You know what I'm saying? He's getting 25, 20, 27, and 20. There and still jacked. <laughs> right. And Robinson's not what he was, but he's still a, a legit seven footer who still can give you points and rebounds. And he's a defensive stalwart, so he's blocking shots. So he's still yeah. altering shots in there. So you got a Duncan, you got a Robinson, and you're going to the hole and you don't have your guy in Dirk. That's a lot of that's a lot to ask, and I also think that you were better with Nick Van Essel off the bench, where he had to play more extended minutes with yep. the Steve Nash. I think it kind of messed up the chemistry with that, and I felt things kind of were off with that as well. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, you know that that was really the only move you could make at that point because Van Exel was yeah. your, your best X factor in the playoffs right. at that point once Dirk was got out. But uh, yeah, it, it definitely messed with your rotation a little bit and ended up not being as fruitful as you hoped. Obviously you get the one game in game five, but yeah, it doesn't pay out in the long term for them. Now the, the plus side for Dallas, I mentioned how the next year was a brutal kind of fall from grace. You know, they, they go from game six of the West finals to losing in five in the opening round the next year against Sacramento. But at the very least that, that following off season's draft class would actually be very fruitful. And this is another reason why I think if Nash had stayed, the way Dallas retooled and the kind of players they retooled with would have been fascinating to see with Nash. That's actually one of the very rare years where they not only take the draft seriously, but hit a home run in the first round and draft future all-star and franchise cornerstone piece, Josh Howard. They also sign as an undrafted free agent, Marquise Daniels. And that was two fantastic pieces to add to your team uh coming out of that 03 that historic 03 draft class and yeah that's that's pretty good if you if you could have had dirk nash daniels and howard uh kind of at at the core of your team and then you're just kind of picking these other parts around obviously finley's still there for a little bit longer has about a year or two of overlap with josh howard and daniels very very uh competent team that you've got there and it's just kind of like how you try to navigate this evolution from a just run and gun offense full throttle as they called it into a more defensive minded team nash would he have made the transition super well i don't know but if they could have found a way to marry the two then you keep an absolute floor general that they sorely lacked in 2006 i love jason terry jason terry would never have been a maverick it was not a it was not a point guard Right, and he wasn't a point guard, but he was your point guard in 2006. He had right, and that's where it guard. messed up. Yep, and he was he was basically the the inverse of Steve Nash in that way. He literally is 31 instead of 13, you know. Um, and it uh, did not did not work in the long run for that. But your point guard position is much stronger in the 06 playoffs than it was. Um, then ended up being like, if you'd had Nash, it would have been way stronger than what you ended up going in there with. And that's no disrespect to Terry as a, as a shooting guard, especially later in his career. Once he started coming off the bench, phenomenal, but Dallas and that 06 team was like, they're a good defensive minded team. They've got some sturdy bigs in there who can block shots. Sagana Jot, for instance. And then it's just kind of Dirk is just being Dirk, like, borderline MVP at the time. Dirk, who was the next year he got MVP. Um, and Howard was breaking through on the cusp that following season as well of his one and only all-star appearance. So a lot of things trending up, but you still are missing crucial pieces from that 2006 team, which is why if that 2016 won, I almost feel like that would have been in, in like a grand scheme of things, like compared to other championship teams, I feel like it would have been one of the weaker teams to win a title. And that's no disrespect to Dirk or Howard or those guys, but like that team felt like it didn't have some key pieces. And you're kind of like, wow, I'm kind of surprised you're here looking back at it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, uh, the thing that's always kind of been my thing with the Mavs is they've always had a lot of talent, kind of like the Cowboys, right? They just had yep. talent, just roll through, or just roll through here. I mean, Dallas and has some players, man. And to see nothing's ever really come up with except one championship, which you are happy at least you got one. Mm-hmm. But you feel like with the teams that they had and the talent that they had, 
you should have had more or you should have been competing and at least been in the series competing for the championship. You know what I mean? Uh, yep. Because it was all that talent that went through the building. And these weren't just like regular players, dog. Like you had a Michael Finley, you had a Steve Nash, you had Nowitzki, you had a Walt Williams who was, wasn't like he was 40, he was 32. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Popeye Jones was a good addition. People have, Popeye Jones had a slept on career. You know what I mean? You still had a Sean Bradley who was a seven, six guy. Um, you know, we talked about Nick Van Exel. I mean, you had some players. Um, yeah. Adrian Griffin was a was a solid. If you ever wanted a defensive player, he could give you some defensive reps. He could play multiple positions, even though he wasn't a big guy. You know what I mean? So they had they had a lot of ingredients, and it's just tough that uh, Dirk went down with that injury. Uh, but when you look back at that year and some other years that Dallas had, you kind of like you said, look at the what if because you had a lot of talent um, and just things that kind of just didn't fall their way. Yep. No, for sure. But that is uh, that is the great what if of the 0203 Mavericks. I think a lot of legacies would have looked vastly different. And I think the Dallas Mavericks moving forward had a chance to win multiple championships. But it's just the way it goes. Sometimes one thing kind of breaks wrong, doesn't happen that one year. And then getting back is so difficult sometimes that a team that looked like it was on the cusp ends up being a never was.